I think we all have a project uh, at hand from 302. Uh, we've been able to identify uh, essentially a few um, classifications that would um, help us describe what a bar building is. I think I've, we've seen several examples of that. To the right, you could see our, our, our case studies that we, so this is a a reminder or a refresher on this. So one was right. The the idea of the length of the building uh, is determined by is the length consistent um, or is it varied if you have multiple pieces working uh, side by side in terms of the aggregation or the building in itself. You could also imagine that there is a certain bend uh, that would uh, assist perhaps with the responding to field conditions, um, what we would identify as, um, um, uh, let's say, uh, variables that are uh, regulating the bend are the, the, the amount of degrees and how frequently the thing bends and in what direction. Um, in addition, I think we also have the branching or the splitting, however you want to describe that, similar to to um, the bend. Um, this is uh, identified by the frequency of the actual branching, um, the degree of the, the, the bend and the direction once again. Um, the curve, I think we've seen a few of those examples too. Um, obviously the defining element here is their actual radius. Uh, and once again, the segment size, depending on how far this goes. Once again, uh, a refresher on or a reminder on the actual case studies that we dealt with. So the reason I bring this up is uh, just as a as a prelude to the later discussion that we're going to have, and that has to do with how we're going to deploy our actual building uh, buildings on the site and how are you going to attempt to uh, aggregate them and respond to your local conditions of of the field. Um, but without without a kind of more in-depth discussion or introducing the studio to some um, seminal thinkers of the say the last century i think that it's it's worth pointing out some uh, uh, some some minds here and one has to do with rudolf Witkover. um i think while well, there's a kind of interesting story about it i think the the upbringing born and raised in Berlin, but I think he always operated under an English passport. Um, and I'm not sure the details on that exactly, but he ended up uh, retiring and um, passing away in, in the US. He ended up uh, producing uh, a whole series of um, um, critical pieces of writing and architecture with Columbia University in New York. Uh, but the reason we're, we're looking at him in particular have to do with his publication on the architectural principles in the age of humanism and what was initially uh, sought as a, a kind of precedent study or analysis of the of um, Palladio's villas uh, he was in search of are there any any rules or any guiding principles from a geomet geometry standpoint that could uh, help us understand um, rhythms and orders and proportional um, um, uh, principles. So it was all in search of looking for harmonies within the geometries. Um, and he used Palladio, Palladio, Andre Palladio um, as, as a case study to understand and unpack uh, relationships of both spaces and proportions. And I think what we stumbled upon with with the study of Whitcover's work was that we could actually classify spaces as they relate to the adjacent space. And and this is um, going to be relevant when we start discussing how to enclose and deal with um, exterior uh, elements as to as a way of controlling um, climate. Um, and and other regulatory kind of elements with the building on the facade or the enclosure it's going to um, really um, come in handy to understand the relationship of of what the space is actually set up to do and what it's asking us to respond to 
So Litkover's work, um, I'm not doing his work and body of work any justice by kind of scrolling through this, but I do think it's important for everyone to kind of at least recognize the importance of, of previous thinkers as they've uh, added um, valuable lessons to our, our current discussion. So these are some of the, the diagrams, um, famously his 14 uh, villas or 11 villas uh, as a way of unpacking relationships of spaces and as they relate to uh, internal organization and how they respond to external uh, factors. Um, and I'll get to this part a bit more in, in detail. But we, if we dig a bit deeper even, uh, when we start thinking about enclosure, we can't uh, avoid the, the work of Gottfried Semper, another German um, architect, art critic, and, 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 and teacher. Once again, a seminal piece of work that I think is still relevant today uh, more than ever, and that is the four elements of architecture, uh, initially published in 1851. And he famously kind of laid out um, sort of the, the four um, principles that could be identified in any piece of architecture. Uh, just like Whitcover, he was uh, a proponent of understanding the, the foundations of, of architecture. And in that search, he's been able to identify uh, the, the four categories. In some cases, we, we might be a bit removed from, from that in today's environment. But I do think if we take a closer look of, of, of those elements, we can translate those into uh, the contemporary context as well. Um, so the search of, of what are the roots of architecture and what makes, what are the elements that contribute to architecture, he's been able to identify the heart, uh, metallurgy, uh, ceramics, um, and, and we, we might wonder, well, we no longer really are um, um, thinking of, of the domestic environment as having and as a kind of core, the, the fireplace. But I think they, we could also translate the hearth as a way of like, let's say food preparation or where cooking happens. Um, that's the heat, like right? that's a, a kind of human response. A roof too, that is a defining element that would um, help us understand space altogether without a roof. I think we have a hard time defining that that will be an enclosure, and that is related to carpentry. Um, I think we can see that in conventional framing, we still utilize those techniques, uh, framing as a way of enclosing space. And then separate from that, there's also the enclosure. Uh, Semper's been, been able to identify that the enclosure has its roots in, in, in textile and in weaving. Um, and that sort of precludes that that is primarily not load bearing, um, but it's something that is, helps us regulate uh, the transition from exterior to interior. Uh, what he's been able to identify as mound or earthwork, uh, I think the contemporary context would probably suggest as a way of siding, uh, how we site things and how we deal with, um, with, the, with the land. Uh, so earthwork is still a, a, a critical piece. Without earthwork or any cuts or moves of dirt, you wouldn't really uh, been able to actually uh, uh, stake stake down and 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 claim land or an enclosure. So the part that we're going to try to unpack here will be a focus on enclosure and the different categories with it or the way it responds to the interior environment um, and Eric is going to help us kind of um, look at a series of, of, of techniques and ways of looking at from from an exterior perspective but also from an interior um, point of view. So if we go back to Whitcover's um, taxonomy of, of spaces we can also uh, and that's been a bit, um, a or it's been a really interesting um, set of studies here, and that has to do with regardless of what building, we can identify or locate um, 
relationships of, of, of spaces as they relate to one another. So there are roughly four categories. Uh, I think we, we generally, if we say a space has an open relationship, it actually has an adjacency to a direct exposure to an exterior condition. I think we could all uh, subscribe to that. Um, I think we also have something of a semi-open, and I think uh, in the Southern California context, I think the, the value of a semi-open environment is tre tremendously valuable. Uh, primarily, it has an exterior and open condition contained within an assembly. So, for example, the courtyard, the interior courtyard, or interior um, circulation spaces, as we have in our bar building. Um, would, would classify as being semi-open. Uh, we also have something of what we call the semi-closed. It's an interior condition adjacent to an open assembly. Um, so that's, that's semi-closed and the closed, um, and in this diagram you could see that the space C is surrounded by um, adjacent spaces. So its relationship to the exterior is always about the transition from one space to another. And in a way, we, we, we find those spaces, primarily these being either like kitchens, bathrooms, uh, spaces that ne don't necessarily require um, adjacency to an exterior wall. Um, but we can also see that the, the perimeter uh, could be described as having um, adjacent walls to the exterior and have a, um, a, a more more um, direct relationship of regulating environmental um, factors. So um, if we took this as a simple house or something that has a kind of perimeter that you can chase around, you can find these three categories this way. In a bar building, you can imagine that this this kind of repetition um, could be endless, the core always being C or as being a closed, uh, the corner or the perimeter walls dealing with uh, perimeter um, uh, issues. And if we if we go into a bit more uh, the, the coding and unpacking of that as it relates to the different uh, types, you'd see that the open relationship, if we were to kind of color code this, would be anything that touches the perimeter has a direct relationship to the, the exterior. The semi-open in, in this configuration doesn't really exist. Uh, you have a semi-closed and a closed. So the closed space right here, its relationship to this is, is that of a closed. Um, and here are maybe sort of four categories or four samples where the, the, the we're sort of displaying a semi-open configuration. So you could see, for example, the simplest, if the interior of a building has a void or is open, has a void, it has a semi-open relationship from one space to the exterior and to the total exterior, this would be an open. Um, and the adjacencies are about the, the semi-closed. Um, you can also see that the covered outdoor, let's say you have an outdoor um, a patio, for example, um, you would you would have a configuration of, of bees as it relates to a semi-open, um, but where the bee also has an open relationship. And then this is obviously a kind of contained space. Um, so we can classify almost any building in these four categories, uh, three categories, our four categories and in the three types. Um, and again, I think we're we're rushing through a much deeper conversation on this and gets into um, discussions on on uh, topology, uh, surface logics, um, when things have uh, multiple holes. Um, um, uh, but maybe that's something for for a later conversation. So. As an intro, uh, this was an attempt of, of kind of covering a lot of ground. One is from the existing buildings that we've studied uh, to the two voices that I will consider seminal in, in this whole conversation, Semper and uh, Witkover. 
um, and uh, kind of unpacking of these um, uh, classes or classifications within the space. So um, on that note, I can either um, transition to, I'll stop sharing, I can transition to, to Eric's conversation um, and, and see if we have any other missing pieces. All right, uh, thank you very much, Philip. So uh, can you hear my voice? Is it clear? Because I don't know if the microphone is working properly or not. Yeah, you're good. Uh, yeah, yeah, loud and clear. Right. Awesome. That's yeah. great. Clear. So uh, so thank you. That was that was a very interesting, you know, just like introduction. I learned a lot from this. So I think it's um, uh, the next part, actually, I would like to talk about um, is called uh, based on my conversation with uh, Philip and then uh, obviously um, guys, uh, your professors are in charge. So I'm talking about some of the things. So they are uh, this is their call. Actually, if they would like to uh, use some of these with the adjustment that they have in their mind. So uh, uh, it's really um, important to keep in mind that um, you need to follow them, uh, although that at the same time that uh, we are talking about these topic and then if you have any sort of questions so you can come back to me, ask for the technicality, uh, but as for the studio of flow is uh, uh, you should follow your professors. So uh, what we're going to do uh, with this like a kind of uh, two or two and a half uh, session of the uh, lectures and workshops. So we are trying to achieve a kind of, you know, just like a um, probably um, uh, understanding about the uh, the uh, the tectonics of facade or facade tectonics in a, a computational uh, uh, method with a computational method and in, in a computational uh, 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 manner. Uh, and then what does it mean? We're going to get to that. But before that, I would like to bring up a kind of like a short uh, sort of uh, definition of the uh, facade and uh, uh, the words that we've been using for facade and a kind of taxonomy and the categorization, although there are so many different ways of categorization, uh, categorizing, you know, just like facade. And then uh, we're going to move to um, uh, one a quick sort of um, uh, demonstration of the difference between um, um, computational design and computational modeling. And then uh, later uh, we're going to uh, have uh, the uh, introduction to uh, the uh, um, technical part and then we're going to jump into the uh, software and then we're going to start using the software uh, that uh, we uh, should have in here. So everyone has the software ready on their computers. I'm assuming that it's uh, Rhino 6 plus Grasshopper, which is coming with Rhino 6. And if you're using Rhino 5, still you're good. Uh, but you need to download uh, Grasshopper for this uh, uh, series of the uh, lectures that we have in here. So uh, let me share my screen with you guys so to see if we can. All right. So. Uh... All right. OK, hopefully you can see this and everything is clear. So this is the kind of, you know, just like introduction to uh, the boarding for um, facade and uh, what we know them as elevation. So these words have been used in interchangeably actually for a long time. So with skin, envelope, facade, elevation, a screen enclosure, wrapping. So this is a this is a very interesting, you know, just like uh, usage of the words. But still, uh, there are some differences. What we're going to uh, actually use as a kind of terminology in here, so we're going to use some of these guys, um, specifically uh, facade, and then uh, just a quick uh, sort of note about the difference between facade and elevation. And then also we use uh, a skin and a screen, but probably other um, uh, wording in here, there are more uh, Developed and they are more specialized in some specific area in in uh, uh, architecture and construction. So uh, the first thing that I would like to look into uh, uh, and then pay attention to that, and then asking you to pay attention is the definition 
for elevation and facade and then uh, and the etymology of the word actually the elevation, which means that it's you are elevating something and it's it's implying that elevation and then the way that we, we have been perceiving elevation over the past uh, uh, probably um, uh, um, centuries. Uh, it was part of the building and then we designed everything as a part of the building. But at the same time, I would believe that elevation uh, is a it, it can be seen as every surface of any edifice or building facing towards uh, facing towards outside or outwards and then placed apart from the juxtaposed surrounding buildings. And then if you have like a kind of a smaller sort of surfaces that people cannot walk through that or we don't need any sort of, you know, just like exterior um, expression for the building, so we don't call them elevation. And then, uh, but what would be the difference between a facade and elevation? Look at the definition that we are seeing on the right hand side. I'm not interested in that definition. That's the reason that I put it over there. Uh, I think this is a very general sort of, you know, just like explanation about facade. Uh, but on the left hand side, I would define facade as an objective response uh, to the design of a screen or a skin to separate outside and inside a partition, splitting up exterior and interior as a spatial enclosure. So the spatial enclosure doesn't need to be completely, you know, just like closed or completely open, as also Philip explained. So we have like that type of, you know, just like the um, taxonomy of the uh, of the facade. So facade basically is a is a French word and then we use it. We adopted actually in English, so we are using it a lot. So then the um, capitalization or not capitalization and materialization actually of elevation. So these days is being used as facade, which means that it's part and uh, a component of the building or component of the design in here. Uh, we are mostly um, focusing on the design and the tectonics of the, of the facade rather than getting to the technicality. So technicality and how much of the technicality that you need for your studio is again is up to your professor. So um, um, building upon and piggyback on, on uh, what um, uh, Philip talked about, uh, I would like to bring up a uh, uh, sort of understanding uh, about wall uh, in German. Uh, again, this one is by Gottfried Sampa. So, and then this is the, the difference between Mauer and Wand. So both of them are being, has been used actually in English literature interchangeably for wall, but there is a difference between Mauer and Wand. And then what is the difference? I can tell you just like a kind of short version of that, but if you go to the etymology of the word in, in German, you can see that uh, why uh, these guys are different. So Maurer, um, in, in English uh, sort of pronunciation, Maurer is more of a, um, uh, I, I would say the part of the wall that is working toward a performance for the outside and then a wand uh, or wand or land. It's a more of a kind of, you know, just like the, um, relationship between that wall that you build or that facade that you build uh, to the to the inside. And then if you if you've seen some of the other type of, you know, just like interpretation probably is not uh, German aware uh, sort of interpretation. Uh, I mean, as for the language, because uh, it's a very interesting, you know, just like history behind this. So um, we got to the uh, taxonomy um, study for the elevation or for the facade, I would say. And then we have like different way of categorizing the facades, uh, but I'm gonna bring up some of them that we need in here. And then we need for your studio uh, sort of uh, level of your of your uh, learning. And then the, the thing that we need actually for our work. So the first part is a kind of morphological sort of approach. And then I would like to say that we can have like uh, this is a kind of very uh, simple sort of explanation, very simple example. I'm not um, making this um, taxonomy uh, study very complex, so you can imagine any other um, uh, sort of uh, uh, variation for this uh, part. So I use a box and then I'm seeing that this is a kind of surface. This is a planar surface or planar. 
surface that we have is it flat and uh, we don't have any sort of erosion like curvature in this surface that we have so we call it planar or a flat surface so this is the major uh, focus of our work in here in your studio but i would like to bring up that we have another category for the um uh, shape of the of the facade and that is a single surface um single curved surface and uh, which means that we have only on one um uh, axis of the surface we have the um curvature and then we have like some uh Uh, the surface that we play. Yeah. The, I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Oh uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I think you right. just cut out the last ten seconds or so. Uh, oh. The, the oh, network quality. Yeah. Oh, bad network quality. So I don't know what is that. So. Is is it working now? You think? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. All right. So here I I can see my image also. Yeah. Yeah. So then we have the uh, single curve surface, and then the next one is the double curve surface, which means that we have like the uh, along both uh, axes of the surface, we have the curvature. And uh, these, this is a really huge challenge for any type of, you know, just like design in uh, either for modeling or for computational design and then obviously for the fabrication part implementation of the project and then uh, building the real project is also is really uh, uh, um, I would say uh, uh, problematic and uh, we need to figure out what we need to do and then actually one of the very interesting um, and important usage of the computation uh, and the computational design uh, is going to this part, but it's going to be very advanced. And then uh, the the strategies that we are going to use for doing this, uh, it's really uh, actually sophisticated. So we don't want to touch the um, curve and then I mean single curve and then double curve sur surfaces in here. So uh, in here, there is uh, one more thing that I would like to mention before going to the second uh, type of the category uh, or second type of the categorization or taxonomy for the facade. I use uh, a kind of analogy. I try to not to be biased toward any specific, you know, just like a style or shape for the uh, uh, for the uh, components of the building in here. That's why I, I have all these, you know, just like a uh, melting pot of different sort of style in here. That that was a that was a kind of intentional uh, uh, in here. So uh, the components of facade always is just like uh, uh, it's four major components. It can be only one component as the first one that I have here, and it's uh, threshold or what we call barricade or um, other people come uh, fortification, which means that it can be a wall. Uh, it doesn't need to have any sort of fenestration, any opening or something. So the second one is the opening frame or fenestration. Uh, it can have, it can't be behind the wall toward the inside, or it can be aligned with the line of the wall, or it can uh, tend toward the outside. So uh, uh, see it as both side development. And then the third one in here, uh, something that you call it in a, in a technical way as the second skin or double skin facade or something. Uh, I would I would look into that as a curtain, as a uh, control or additional skin. Doesn't need to be only one. It can be two or it can be three or it can be a kind of you know just like uh, a layers, a different layers to the going to the outside. And then uh, we are uh, designing those actually a lot in uh, in in architecture and in a computational design. And then more contemporary works, they have like more of these uh, uh, elements. And then the fourth one, which is uh, which I would like to call a shading or louvering, uh, which means that we have like some elements, it, even if it's not being used for the uh, um, performance base. Um, 
goal or outcome, but they are uh, looking like the shading and louvers. So the second um, a type of categorization that I would like to bring up is the relationship between the facade and the design of the facade and with the uh, um, surroundings and then with the juxtaposing elements. The first one is called autonomous uh, design, which is that you have only the entity and the entity. It can be called a building or a installation or edifice or uh, whatever you would like to call that. And then this is completely autonomous from the outside and inside. So you design something without considering the um, the elements around you or inside the building as the program. So the second one that um, uh, I put a name and I, I uh, actually borrowed this from Philip as the symbiotic so and then that is a combination between entity and then uh, context. So there is a um, relationship between uh, the effect of the context around the building uh, to the building and it can be a shadow, it can be view, it can be any uh, type of, you know, just like the factors, uh, including climatic factors and other things. So then it's a site aware, I would call it a site aware uh, or context aware design. And then it's it's symbiotic in a way uh, that uh, having that relationship with the surrounding. And the third one, uh, which is uh, a um, Buckminster Fuller sort of term uh, for any type of building, I would look at it as a kind of, you know, just like term also for the facade design. And it's called uh, synergistic. Some people call it appropriate, but I would I would uh, synergistic is a, is a better sort of term, I believe. So synergistic, which means that you have a system and that that system is working uh, with the outside, with the inside, and also the tectonics and also the elements as a system. They're working together and, and uh, appropriately and then also cohesively. So the entity plus the context uh, uh, plus the performance. And some people say, oh, you know what? When we are designing the window, we are aware of the building back be uh, of the program back behind it. Well, I don't think that more than probably a uh, uh, majority of the of the buildings, they are not uh, like working with the program. When I say that it's working with the program, which means that getting to the highest level of detail that when you put a window somewhere, that you are aware of where the bed is going to be inside if it's a bedroom back, back behind it. Or if you are designing an office block, so you need to know the, where is the location for the desk of the people that they're working or any other type of spaces. If you say that, oh, you know what, this is office, then I did uh, design this based on the function back behind it. It doesn't mean that this is a synergistic. So, what we are doing in here uh, as a uh, very important uh, part of our job. So we are focusing on the autonomous and then going to the symbiotic and then synergistic, which is uh, like a very um, high demand and then sophisticated um, uh, part of the computational design. It's uh, on you if you would like to do more investigation, you need to uh, spend more time. It's not a kind of easy job to do. So there, there are so many softwares to uh, do this and then take it to the next level. So hopefully the first uh, item is going to ignite the um, uh, the curiosity actually in you guys to go uh, forward and then do more. So and then the um, uh, last part that I that, or the last type of the categorization, which is going specifically to the design of the of the facade is um, uh, uh, thinking uh, the facade, I would say, and I would call it, and then that is uh, uh, the relationship uh, between the designer and the components of the facade. And then if you see everything as the pieces and then pieces are coming together, uh, which we call a part to whole. So you start from the part and then you go all the way to the whole and then the whole thing is coming out. And then you are thinking about some of the things in midway. So for example, in this example that you see on the left hand side, so there are some opening and then you need to take care of the tectonics and at the same time architectonics 
of the of the facade and then see how it works. And then as you see in this picture, probably is not working with the size of the components that we are having in here. So who is really um, actually uh, specialized in this type of um, um, approach? Uh, probably Richard Meyer is one of the one of the actually architect that they are doing a, a really interesting modular sort of uh, uh, work um, uh, in this man in this uh, manner actually. And then. Uh, the other one, which is called a whole two part, or uh, I would call it superimposition, which means that you are having a kind of hole and then you try to get into designing some part of that. And then you are taking out, you're uh, adding, subtracting some of the things to that. And then even in the course of action and in, in implementation phase, sometimes uh, you send the uh, the piece to the offsite production and then they stay uh, produce it and then send it to the site. And then this is like uh, a whole two part in a, um, a superimposition. There are some samples around the uh, in the Internet and you can find them on Internet and everywhere else. But uh, these are some of the samples. We are not going to get to this type of thing in here, but this is like a, a very um, um, uh, probably simple samples of what you can do. If you would like to see more, you can go to my Instagram channel and then uh, my website and then see some of the other works over there. What we are doing in here, uh, we take some uh, baby steps, but at the same time, these are really uh, solid steps for understanding the uh, facade and how we design the facade with the computational tools. And uh, I think, um, uh, and then I hope uh, you're going to enjoy this. So the first part is exercise one. It's not in the order that I'm going to talk about, but this is based on the order of the layers of the facade that I showed you before. So you have, a, you have the uh, first one, which is the barricade, and then you have the second one, which is the fenestration in this. So this is exercise one. So, and we're going to develop exercise two. Exercise two is mostly seen as a kind of secondary or additional sort of a skin. And then it's a very um, interesting, uh, uh, I would say, a game changer of the past at least like uh, 20 years. And then you can see all these works in the work of uh, uh, Tom Main. Uh, to uh, all the way to the West Coast. And this is like a kind of uh, 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 probably very interesting uh, or very, um, I would say, popular uh, way of dealing with the skin. So we're having like one example of using the punch and then puncture into uh, the skin in here, and then you can manipulate that. And then exercise number three, which is going to the um, the last part, which is the shading part, and then uh, the shading and louvering. Uh, so we are seeing the 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 most uh, outward part of our um, work and uh, facade design. And uh, uh, I think uh, everything that you are seeing in any type of building, it's not exceeding than these four layers, although that we can have more of every one of these guys and more than one layer. So, and uh, if you have any questions, so let's open up to the question. All right, okay, so I think it sounds, we don't have any question in here. Yeah, no, okay, I, let's, I think that, that's great, Eric. I, Eric, I, um, I think the uh, advantage of this is also that the, the, the lecture is, is recorded and we'll be able to review this again and we'll be able to uh, collect any any uh, topic related questions or technical questions and uh, address the, those in, in the next coming workshops or a follow up. So sure. uh, yeah, let's go. Let's dive into the, are we, right. are, this. Is, this is where we fire up the machine. Yes. This is the part. So yes, exactly. So I'm I'm going to explain what is the difference actually between the computational design and then modeling, and then uh, because everyone has a kind of misunderstanding, uh, whoever is not um, familiar with these terms, uh, and then they think you know so like they're uh, they're similar, but I'm gonna sh I'm gonna show a very quick demonstration for like few minutes, 
And then what is the difference? And then as soon as we got that kind of, you know, just like think because some of these students, I believe that they are uh, familiar or most of them, they are familiar with modeling, but probably few of them, they're familiar with the difference between computational design and um, uh, computational modeling. And I'm going to explain that. Then we're going to jump into the um, next part. Then I'm going to ask everyone to uh, turn on your computer. Uh, I mean, um, um, run your uh, Rhino. And then, uh, and then Grasshopper, and I'm going to explain what we need to do. Sounds good. Awesome. All right, so let's jump into our work. And it, uh, having kind of example in here probably is going to help us to see what's happening in here. So I have one uh, grain. This is, a, this is called voxel uh, architecture or voxel design. Uh, what you call it actually pixelated design, which is not, uh, to be honest with you, it's not pixelated design. It's called voxel, V-O-X-E-L. So you start designing something based on this. And uh, you start with this to make a voxel um, or pixelated as you sometimes you use this as a pixelated sort of, you know, just like a tower. Uh, you've seen in uh, the work of MDRDV and then Oli Sharon, uh, who was working for uh, OMA before. So I would like to use this and then in the modeling sense. So this is a modeling sense. So we use this in this in the modeling sense when I'm doing this right now. So I'm going to use this and then I'm going to array this. Uh, let's say nine uh, along X and then nine along y and then let's say uh 30 along z and then also i need to have like the um uh, direction and then distances between these guys i would say x3 and then y3 and then z3 so i'm going to have like my tower in here then i see that oh you know what probably is not the correct thing so i need to change the number along z that i can change this and then to 40 then I'm going to get more than this. And it's like, oh, well, no, I think 45. So, OK, 45. So I'm designing something and then modeling something based on the schema that I have in my brain or I have been working on it on a paper or whatever. So then I said, you know, just like this is the end of the command that we have in here. Then I'm going to say press enter. And then as soon as I press enter, everything is done. And then I cannot change this unless that I'm going to run the command again and I, I start you know just like doing some probably carving in here so i'm going to uh, delete some of these part and then i started you know just like designing this based on the modeling uh, sort of you know just like um, culture that i have so i'm trying to use some uh, uh, type of quick uh, sort of cutting in here and then see what i can do and i'm designing something very quick short sort of thing that i can do in here and then on top i would like to get rid of these guys and uh, probably a little bit of the tower on the other side based on the design that i have i don't know if it's a kind of a static sort of measurement or if it's a, a technical measurement or uh based on the program that you have whatever uh, the driver is so i'm going to do something uh, in voxel architecture and i'm going to design this and i was like okay yeah that's fine so i think i like this and i'm gonna i'm gonna use this for my design and the problem is coming where I don't like this. And then I, again, I need to um, redo this, although that we can undo this right now. But if we're going to save the file and then we're going to reopen this, the entire information of the process is gone, which means that we don't have any control on the process of the design or um, of the uh, of the modeling in here. Unlike the other side of this story, and that side is more of the computational design. And the computational design is a program actually is running a kind of a script. And then as you can see that I have like one option in here, but this option is working based on uh, the um, script that I wrote in here. And then look at this. So I have like the it kind of, you know, just like a iteration I, I one, and then these are some of the parts that uh, it's taken out based on some type of factors or parameters. That's why we call them prometric architecture. Prometric architecture is not a uh, kind of bad word. So 
it's it's mostly because we are working with the numbers. So if I'm going to change and start changing this, look at this. So I don't need to um, redo the modeling in here. So everything, whatever is happening in here is based on the um, calculation based on the uh, parameters that I um, define in here then I am the architect of the uh, building and also I am the architect of the process. So in here, I can do something really quick um, in here. So, and I can bake this. Okay. So I can bake this and I can use this in here and I can say it takes a little bit of time. Yes, I have this guy. So this is one of my options. Then I can get back again to the um, definition that I have in here and I can use a different sort of definition in here that I can get back again and then get another iteration and then bake it. OK, then this is also ready. So imagine that if I and there is some um, actually um, uh, program that we call evolutionary solver. If we connect this to evolutionary solver, which is going through the uh, different iterations and different poss possibilities, actually we can see um, millions and millions of mutations in here and then changes of the different sort of, you know, just like uh, the combination of the uh, solid and void and then we can make uh, whatever we need and then if you are working even on the uh, other part of the definition you're going to have like more detail and then more um, of the different sort of uh, 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 process so hopefully uh, everyone got a kind of you know sense of the difference between uh, the um, modeling and also uh, the uh, computation in here so Let's just start with our work and then what we need actually in here. So everyone, please um, um, open up your um, Rhino 6. You need to go to, let me close off this guy. So if you're following me um, in here, so I'm I'm not spending, you know, just like uh, so much time on, on opening and closing or something. So if you're following me in here later, you're watching this video, so you can do this. So you need to go to your uh, Rhino Five or Rhino Six. So you're gonna open up the uh, uh, Rhino um, version, whatever version that you're using, and I'm going to need one more thing. So if you go to these tabs, I'm I'm pretty sure that every one of you guys are uh, familiar with Rhino. If you go to the standard tab in Rhino 6, so there is a button here, it's called Launch uh, Grasshopper. If you're running Rhino 5, so you need to uh, open up Rhino 5 and then by opening up Rhino 5, so you can uh, see um, that there is no button over there and then you need to just like uh, run. Let me see if I have this guy in here. So this is Rhino 5 and it, I don't have in the standard. I don't have that tab in here, so I need to run Grasshopper and then run it. And then if you have like some of the components that are working on uh, Rhino um, five, uh, Rhino six, so they are not uh, being run in Rhino five, and in Grasshopper for Rhino five. Then you're gonna get some errors. Don't worry about those errors. Like these are not like a kind of huge big of the deal. So I mean, you can fix those kind of errors. So then this is Rhino six. So we have like getting this started with uh, Grasshopper um, for Rhino six. So we don't want to use these guys at all. So you can close them off. And then we have like one thing in here that we call canvas. So obviously I would like to, for the beginners, I would like to have like the thing setting up on the right hand side and the left hand side. I would like to put this on perspective uh, display. And then on the right hand side, I'm going to have the grasshopper. And then this is like the canvas that I'm using. So obviously that we see that the, the 
uh, panels on the top and an option that we got in here and the tabs on the button side. So if you are using from scratch, uh, the, um, the Grasshopper is coming with only 10 tabs and then the rest of these guys, these are uh, developed by the other people. Um, uh, some of the plugins that we call all of these guys, we call plugins. So in, in by default, you're going to have the params, uh, math, and then set, and a vector, curve, uh, surface, mesh, intersection, and then trans, um, transition, and then also, uh, tra sorry, transformation, and then also display. So these are the 10 tabs that you're going to get. Don't worry if you don't see these guys. So this is not important for you. So and uh, so what we need to do, we need to get a kind of sense of what's going on in here. So we have like um, this tab, uh, this canvas, and then these tabs up in here. So if I click on these guys, so this is like point. This is called point. If I'm going to. Uh, drag down uh, one for myself. So by clicking on on point and then dragging on the canvas and then releasing the mouse button. So you're going to have the point on the canvas. So this is called component. So we call this. So we call this. The component. Or some people call it node because we're using other softwares and, and the other softwares like, um, um, I don't know, like uh, World Machine, like uh, Unreal Engine, like uh, uh, Blender, um, like um, other softwares like uh, Material Substance Maker. These are called node uh, or Black Magic Fusion. Uh, these are called node, and then we in here in uh, Grasshopper we call them component. So node or component doesn't matter that those are the same. It can be interchangeably. So this is one type of the component that we have, and then we call these guys um, containers. So these are only containing some sort of information. They don't do anything, and they don't they don't have any operation in them. So we have also operations. Uh, we have like several types of the um, uh, components, but I'm going to talk about only a few of these guys. So we have also, um, let me see if I, uh, because I've been using the mouse uh, and keyboard for a long time. So let me bring it up this in here. So this is called um, uh, operational sort of component which means that there is a operation inside this. And then when we use this, this guy is doing something for us. So this component is doing something for us. What does it mean? Which means that if I'm going to hover over the component, it says, you know, so like move, uh, meaning that it's going to move the element that I'm going to give and I'm going to feed that with. So I have movement in here and I have point. So point is a container. And then move is an operational um, uh, component, and then we use it for the operation purposes. And then also we have like again, I, I told you we have other components, but other types of components. Also, we have like another type of uh, another um, very important component is panel, and then also we have the slider, uh, both MD slider and also number slider. We use mostly number slider, not uh, MD slider. MD slider is a little bit, you know, just like more advanced. And then number slider, this is like the uh, um, values that we have. And then we can, by double click on this side, so we can get to the um, uh, settings for the number sliders. So we can have like, okay, two digits. So the maximum is going to be uh, 20, and the minimum is going to be negative 20. So OK and OK. So now my slider is going to be between negative uh, 20 and then positive 20. So and then what wherever I put this. So then this is going to be the numerical value that I'm getting from this slider. So um, if you pay attention uh, before or now uh, to this uh, fact, actually what we have like some of the components that um, there are two 
hooks or there are two actually uh, part that we can hook uh, to that. Uh, on the left hand side and right hand side, we have like some of the other components that we have, they have only one hook. And then we have other components like uh, probably, um, um, let me see what I, I'm going to get. Um, Grid. So we have the vector display in here. And then vector display, it has only one uh, hook on the left hand side. So we have the components on the right. If I would like to put them in the order, uh, we have components on right hand side with hook and then both side and then also right. Uh, uh, sorry, right hand and left hand. So now we have like a kind of you know general understanding about the categorization of the components, but we're going to jump into how we're going to use these guys. So these are working because it says that it's gray, but this is not working. So this is really important. So it's something is lacking actually in here. And it's that's why we have this uh, conversation button in here. And also we have it in orange. And then also uh, this guy in here is working because there are some default sort of priority inside that, but it doesn't mean that is working toward what we need. And then don't worry about these guys. These are more advanced for you guys. It's not like a kind of thing that you would like to use. So and um, this is also two side, but this is really in, important to understand that we use this to get the information or to have the output for the information or data and then uh, um, uh, both input and output. So input and output. So we have a flow of the of the program and uh, mm, the the um, uh, values plus the operation plus the container from left to right. So everything don't worry. Don't forget this. So from left to right, always from left to right. So we don't have any other way. So if you saw the um, uh, organization from right to left is not correct. So we have left side is being run actually by um, Grasshopper first, and then we're going to get to the right hand side and then and then uh, next one and then next one. So what is happening in here? We have like some type of information on the left hand side and then if the data that we have on the left hand side or the values that we have or the parameters or numbers or any objective entities that we have is corresponding with the right hand side correctly. If I'm going to connect this, then we can have the um, uh, uh, the uh, program uh, getting run by Grasshopper. But in this case, the movement, uh, well, I can show you a kind of, you know, just like a quick demonstration in here for the movement. I need a geometry, so I need a geometry in here. So I'm going to use a geometry. By the way, if you double click on um, Canvas, double left click on Canvas and and search something. So uh, uh, search some words, every uh, word, every component that it, it contains that word, you know, just like it's coming up. So now I have this guy and I have like the uh, the box in here. And this is the box that I draw in uh, Rhino and this is a modeling part, but I can use this as a uh, as an import to Grasshopper and then I can use it later as an import to Grasshopper. So I have a geometry in here and I would like to assign this geometry to this container. This is also a container. So where you can find the container on the parameters on the geometries. So I have a series of the containers in here. One of them is point. The other one is line circle, burp, and then geometry and then and so on and so forth. But we use only few of them, not all of these guys. So because the other the other ones that there are we have access to the other components to them and then we don't use container that much actually. So at the beginning, we need a container if you would like to bring in something from uh, from Rhino to Grasshopper. So what will you need to do? You need to go and click on the right component. You cannot use a node or point 
uh, node actually for um, box, so it should be geometry or also it can be a bear. So what is the difference? Uh, well, I cannot explain this like this with this much of time that we have in here, but um, uh, later you can uh, learn more. So I'm going to select this guy and I'm going to right click on the um, icon of the component that we have and then I can say that set one geometry and then as soon as I set one geometry that you can see this color in here, which means that is red, which means that I haven't click on the component that is containing this, but there is a component in the on the canvas that is containing this this uh, um, box. And if I'm going to click on the right component, so it's getting uh, green. Obviously, that you can change the colors, but don't do this. So green, green and red are the are the best color for using in here for now. So and uh, this guy uh, turn into gray uh, rather than being orange and it's not orange anymore. So, which means that it has something inside this. So if I would like to have more than one component, one uh, geometry inside the component, in this case that I can have like more than one geometry, I can uh, select all of these guys and then right click on this and then uh, set multiple geometries. So all these multiple geometries are working together being added to this container and then this container uh, um, is corresponding with these four geometry that we have in here. If I'm going to hide these guys, if I'm going to hide them so you don't see the boundary around this, but it's still there back behind this is running by Rano and then everything is being added to this uh, geometry. So it's over there. If you're going to turn, if you're going to um, shut down your Rhino and then you don't save these boxes. These boxes are going to be gone. So you need to save these boxes. Uh, save the Rhino file separately from the uh, Grasshopper file. So Grasshopper saving is separate from gra uh, Rhino save. So and then also the uh, file extension is different. So file extension in, in Rhino is different than Grasshopper. Grasshopper is GH and then file extension uh, extension for Rhino is 3, 3DM. So, and if I would like to keep the information that I have in Rhino and then transfer the information actually to Grasshopper, I can right click on this component that I want and then I said internalize the data. So internalize the data that I have, then if I'm going to, if I'm not going to save this and I'm going to new a uh, uh, file in here and I'm going to use this, so I can still I can have these guys, although there is no geometry in here. There is no Rhino geometry. So the geometry is in here is in Grasshopper. It's not a Rhino geometry. Hopefully everyone got this part. This is a really important part because we need to see that the relationship between Grasshopper and Rhino. And then if I would like to get the object in or entities that I have in one specific component, what I can do, I can go on that component and then right click on this and then say bake. So you can bake them. So and uh, layer number five and then yes, I would like to keep them as a group. OK, so I have these boxes. Now I have the geometries in Rhino. I don't recommend you to um, internalize the complex geometry because you're going to lose some information, some of the some part of the uh, information regarding the um, objects uh, when you're internalizing the data. Uh, but it's up to you, so you can uh, you can do it. But uh, you need sometimes it's very um, expensive sort of experience. So I would like to keep the Rhino file separate from Grasshopper file. So and what does it mean? It means that I have like one component in here and this is the geometry component. So and I would like to uh, write a short definition of the first uh, program in here. And then that is these geometries. It can be move along X axis. So this is a unit X. So which means that this is a unit vector that we got under vector, under a vector tab uh, and in vector sector. 
So we have unit X, unit Y, and then unit Z. So I would like to move this for uh, how many units? 6.09 unit along X. So I would like to move it. Or I would like to move it 20 units. Or I would like to move this for 50 units. And I can change this number, the slider, and I can increase that number. And this is 50 units that's being moved actually along X axis. And then what else that I need to do actually is just like I should understand that this is a huge difference between computation and modeling. And then none of these guys that you had before, including the geometry that we had at the beginning and then we imported to the to Grasshopper, it's not going to be gone at all. So if you would like to copy something, there is no copying. So there is moving and then moving, which means that I have this guy and then move it for the certain amount of distance. And then that is a copy of the first object that we have. But we cannot turn these guys off by keeping, by pressing, keeping control and then press spacebar. So we have the communication circle in here. So this is like a, like a kind of control circle. So I can say that this is a blindfolded person in here. So he says, not turn it off. So as soon as I'm gonna turn off the color for the uh, component is getting like a kind of dark grayish. And then the object that we had in, in the scene of Rhino is, um, uh, disappear. So again, if I'm going to select this and then uh, hold control, press the space bar and then um, enable preview so I can see this. So now again, I'm going to hide this. So now I have the first program of mine and that is the program that I have in here and it's uh, finalized. So I can go and I can say that animate this for me and then animate this, which means that I have like, uh, for example, in here, I have like uh, 20, uh, uh, 23 or 24 actually images for doing this, uh, moving this along X axis. So I don't want to make it like crazy, but I think it's good enough. So I'm going to do this. And then this is animating this guy and I can use it in the folder of cam on my root of my desktop. So I can see these are, this is a very uh, simplistic sort of animation that I have in here. And then this is uh, the beauty and the power of computational design in here. I can see. So any questions so far? OK, awesome. All right, let's jump into our work uh, for uh, and then when we go forward, we're going to have like more topic to talk about. And then uh, I'm going to explain more and more. Uh, so what we're doing in here. So if I get back to the PowerPoint presentation, I would like to start with the third exercise in here because uh, you're going to have like a kind of shading and luring system. Then we're going to get to more of a, um, a different iteration that we got for the for the facade and uh, different uh, components. Sorry for the for the facade, and then we're trying to mimic this type of language in here. So we have like the uh, we have like the um, sorry. So we have the um, uh, surface of your uh, building, and then we try to mimic this type of language of the. Uh, shader, shaders and louvers, although that in a very probably it's super dense for you guys right now. Um, but adding even adding the uh, the support uh, can be completely can be done complete complement um, completely prometric, uh, but it's going to be a very hard actually job to do for you guys. So I'm going to skip this part, although I'm going to share the um, uh, script with you if you would like to add these handles and then the supporting structure back behind the shader shading system. But we're focusing on this part first and then we're going to learn a lot actually by doing uh, in here. So let's just start doing this. So I'm going to turn off. Uh, I can delete this. I don't we don't need it. So uh, as you know that we can set up, uh, we can reset the viewports and everything by double clicking on the four viewports in here in Rhino. So I have this guy. So and I can start with a kind of like a simple sort of, you know, just like definition 
that I want, and then I would like to get into one uh, simple um, surface in here, and that is my surface. I don't want to make it like symmetrical. So let's say. Let's say this is the surface of my building, so it can be any vert, every vert, doesn't matter. So you can rotate this, it can be part of your building, it can be here, it can be here, because this is a prometric sort of, you know, just like word. It doesn't matter where you're moving this, this guy on the right hand side is following this, that's why we call him prometric. So we'll see in a sec. So I have one surface in here, I used a uh, four point surface, and then creation three to four, but four, mostly four, I would like to use four. So I have these four surfaces as the hypothetical surface for your building um, uh, for this quarter that you have for, for the studio. So what I'm going to do in here, I'm going to use a surface and I'm using this surface and this surface. And this is, this should be assigned to this component in here. What I'm going to do, I'm going to select this. I'm zooming in and then right click and then set one surface and then as soon as we set one surface so we have like the color changing and the color of this guy also changed. So uh, what we are doing actually in, in Rhino, uh, we mostly we have the same sort of, you know, just like um, commands that we have in Rhino. We have uh, uh, the equivalent to those um, uh, commands actually in uh, Grasshopper. And uh, one of the thing that we have in here is uh, called, um, um, sorry, contour, <laughs> uh, contour. So I'm just like on a um, double speed. So I got something, um, I got a little bit probably exhausted. So that's fine. So now we have this. Uh, contour in here. You remember that the contour in uh, grass in Rhino probably. So we use contour uh, for let me use the shaded version of this guy, and then going in here and saying in here shaded version, and I have the contour, and I can get the contour. And then select the object, and then I can say that my contour line is going to go this way, and then the distance between these guys is going to be probably, let's say, one, and then the rest of the items that I don't want to touch. So now we got the contour line for the this guy, and then we could have done so many different interesting things with these guys. And then uh, if you remember, or if you've been using this, so this is the contour line for uh, the object that we got. So we have the same sort of thing that we got in here. So we use contour, and then where is that contour? There are uh, four different contours actually in Grasshopper. So you don't want to use the other ones, actually use the one that is under um, uh, intersect and then under uh, mathematical. So under intersect, under mathematical. So you have a contour, so you can go over in here and you can drag down one for yourself. So then I'm going to have this guy and then what it, needs to get from me it needs to get a shape so i'm going to get a shape actually so this is my uh, uh surface that i have for for my design so the second thing that i need is a point doesn't matter so you don't need to add a point for now it's fine so the third thing that i need is the direction so the direction is really important because in in the previous example that you show i showed you in um rhino so the direction that i showed with the mouse uh, so you are picking something with the mouse, but in here we don't have the work of mouse at all. So this is another difference between computation and modeling. So you don't want to uh, rely on your visuals and your eyes and it because you cannot say, hey, silly, look at this. This is the line. I need you to move it to the other side. No, you cannot do that. So you need to um, uh, write this script actually for the computer to understand what you're uh, looking for and then what you're um, asking to execute. Uh, so uh, what I need actually is a direction. So what we have actually in my classes, in my DAF series classes, so I have like uh, at least uh, two sessions on the um, vectors and then vector mathematics. So I need to 
go to uh, get the vector. What is vector? Is it really long a story? So, but everything in, in computer actually is going to vector and then uh, whatever you do in computer is a vector mathematics actually is dependent on, on the vector mathematics. So I'm going to use vector X, Y, Z to build a vector. So I have a vector in here it is showing me is an arrow is showing me the direction and the amount of the movement on along the axis that you want. So by making an X and Y and Z so you can uh, make a number for um, uh, the movement of the thing. So it doesn't matter what is the length because in here we need only direction. So the amp uh, the amplitude of the vector doesn't matter. So direction is the most important thing or the only thing that we need. So everything is going to be between zero and one. So I'm going to get a slider. So how I'm going to get a slider, I can double click in here. I can type one zero uh, one point zero zero. Then I'm going to get the slider in here. So between zero and one point zero zero because I need the direction. So the number between zero and one is the unitized sort of number. So I don't need to get anything else. So then I'm going to delete this. I can select this cop control C control V control V, which means that I have a copy paste these guys. So I'm going to have the um, com, um, what is it? The vector that I got in here and I can show you how the vector works. So let me move this along in here. So I'm going to show you the vector. What is the vector actually? So let me see. Uh, and uh, vector display. So this is vector display. So I have this guy and I'm sorry. I have this guy and I have the point in here. And that is my point uh, set one point is zero and I would like to show you as a demonstration of what's happening in here. So this is the vector that I have and then I can um, uh, multiply this vector to show you the, the actually the size of this vector. The size again doesn't matter in here. The direction is the most important thing that we want or the only thing that we want. So I can add like the a kind of uh, multiplication uh, for the vector. So I have the vector in here, then multiplication of the vector and then going to the vector that I got. So now you can see this is the direction that I have for the um, um, contour that I'm going to use in here. So which means that if I'm going to change these numbers in here, so this guy is being actually moved around and then you can get the different sort of direction. So. What does it mean? It means that this is really interesting. So I'm going to put these guys down if you need to uh, see the video later so we can do some of the other um, exploration in here. So I'm going to use this vector as the direction. So look at the direction in here and then as for the direction in here. So and then I'm going to add the distance. So add the distance of uh, probably 0.1. Uh, I don't know. I put it on 0 0.0. Um, one one to get 10 at the end of the domain that I got in here. Otherwise, you got to, uh, the slider is going to be between zero and one. So this way, when you add like 1.01, .01, then the uh, range of the slider is going to be between zero and 10. So I'm going to use this as a direction. So this is the direction of this contour line and then these contour lines and then this is the distance between them. So and then also I can change the direction of these guys actually. So look at this. So this is changing. This is getting changed based on the direction of the vector. I don't know if you can see in here. So I can change the direction of the vector that I got in here. So I think everything is, is cool. All right. So now we got our our location for our slider. And I said before, this is parametric, which means that if I'm going to move this guy anywhere, so those lines are following these guys and then it's not getting off of the um, image that we got. And even if you rotate them, so it's going to follow those rotations. So you don't need to be worried about what you are doing right now. So later you can manipulate them and then you can adjust them uh, in, uh, and optimize them based on what you need to do. 
and then I don't want to use a Z in here because Z is giving me along Z axis. I don't care about the Z axis for now. So in here, I would like to see only X and Y. Although if I'm going to rotate this, then I need Z later. So because it's along X and Y and Z. So then what I'm going to do in here, I'm going to do something really quick. So if you remember, in uh, Rhino, so we have like the um, any sort of, you know, just like curve and then it can be a closed curve or an open curve. In this case, I'm using a shape as a kind of mimicking the uh, shape of a louver. So we can extrude this and then extrude the curve and then it's coming up. So we have like the extrusion in here. And uh, what I'm going to do in here, I'm going to um, uh, Grasshopper, I'm going to use extrude. So extrude is another component is uh, activating the command command actually in uh, Rhino extrude. So it's under um, um, surface and under um, uh, freeform. So you got the extrude. So under surface, under freeform, you got the extrude. So how much of the extrusion that I want? So this is really important. So the, the, the direction of the extrusion is really important so I can need uh, I'm going to need another um, uh, what is it I uh, come vector in here so and I'm going to use this again one more time so copy paste them so all of these numbers are going to come in here I'm going to use this as a direction but also I need the magnitude which means that it's going to be the amount of the movement or amount of the extrusion along the axis I'm going to get that later so by connecting, sorry, I forgot that how you're going to connect these guys, but uh, because uh, we're going to get, uh, we're going to go forward and we're going to see how you're going to hook the left hand side to the right hand side, uh, and connect connect them with the with the wires. So I'm going to talk about the wires in a sec. So uh, I'm going uh, to use these contours, and then I'm going to use these direction for the uh, direction of the. Uh, vectors that I got in here. So I think this is not really good because it's only along X and Y. So it's it's not good for our purpose, although it can be very cool. Uh, look at this. So it can be very cool and interesting, but I wouldn't use this. Let me uh, turn this guy off. And then um, also I'm going to turn off this guy. So look at this very interesting, you know, just like iteration of this, but I think this is because it's along X and Y. It's on the surface, X and Y surface, so we don't need this. So I'm going to change this to Z, and then look at this. It's now our louvers is coming out of the surface. If I'm going to turn on my surface in here, so I can see that this is my surface of my building, and then and then louvers are coming out. So this is the first step. So uh, what uh, I need to do, so. There are a few things that I would like to explain. One is the connection with the wire between the components. So I have one component, and in the second component that I have in here, so in this case, I use the panel. So panel is showing what's happening inside the other components in a, in a simple way. I can explain this. In a, this is the simplest explanation. But um, all right, so uh, what, I, uh, what I need to do, I need to go to the hook and to the hook for the component and then and um, uh, stay on this and then as soon as you see the arrow, uh, yeah, I don't know if you can see the little arrow on, um, on, on my screen in here. So you can left click and then drag out the wire that we call them wire or some people call it noodle. Uh, so the wire is coming out and then I'm going to connect this to the um, hook on the second component and then release the left button. So as soon as I release, release the left button, so then these guys are going to get connected. If I would like to disconnect this, you need to hold, you need to hold control and then get back. So without control, left click and then with control, left click in here. So if I need to connect more than one surface to this guy. I need to keep uh, to shift uh, to keep shift and hold shift and then connect the second one to the same hook that we have in here. 
So what does it mean? It means that if I'm going to have the second surface on the other side of my building, somehow I would like to design that. And I would like to have like another component in here. And then this is uh, I'm getting my surface in here. So this is the first one. This is the second one. First one, second one. So I'm going to hide this in Rhino to be more clear in Grasshopper. So this is the first surface of my building. And then this is the second one. Probably I don't like the orientation of this. Let me change this. It's bothering me. So uh, show this. Uh, yeah, you and you. And I would like to do something really to show you what's happening as a kind of. Let's say this is the other side of the building or any other surfaces that you have in your building you would like to cover with um, the uh, hide it with the um, louvering system that we have in here. So this is the first one and this is the second one. So you learn that if you right click on this and then you can have multi surfaces in here, but most of the time the people they're um, using um, Grasshopper, they don't like multi surfaces unless that we have like so many surfaces that we cannot uh, assign them separately and then or we have like a number of the surfaces, I would say not so many. So and then what I'm going to do, I need to connect this guy again to this and then this guy is an operation is doing the operation on both of these guys. You don't need to have like two of these. So only two of these guys is enough. So this is the container number one, container number two. This is the left hand side, this is the right hand side. So I'm going to uh, grab this wire and then control shift, uh, sorry, uh, hold shift and then uh, and then connect it to the shape. Then as soon as I connect it, so the uh, uh, louvering is 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 appearing actually in on the on the second surface also. So and then don't forget that if I'm going to uh, change any of these surfaces that I have in here and I would like to have the uh, adjustment to these guys, the whole the whole script is it is being adjusted automatically. So that is again another uh, distance, another a difference between computation and modeling. So it doesn't matter what you're going to do. You're going to do and then use any of these points and changing them. So they're following that. So don't forget that what we are doing in here, it's only on the planar surface and then we don't use any uh, curve surfaces uh, for this assignment, not to, uh, you know, just like make you, you know, just like uh, confuse actually with so much, so much of information in here. So and um, this is hide, and then I'm going to turn off this guy. Also, control space bar, and then turn off. So I don't, I don't want to connect this to the uh, contour component in here. And I'm going to uh, let me turn off this guy too. And uh, what else that I need to do? Because I have like the uh, unitized vector in here, which means that the number that I got in here is only one unit is coming up, uh, or amount of the number that they this is the maximum and this is the minimum of the number so this is amount of the uh, uh, height uh, or depth of these louvers and I would like to make this a little bit um, taller so I'm going to use an uh, multiplication uh, component you can find my multiplication component under mathematics under operators you can drag one uh, down from here or you can open up in here and then you can drag down multiplication in here. So select them, delete them if you don't want them. So I need to disconnect this by uh, holding control and then connect vector to A or B doesn't matter. So we have like the replaceable. So there is no uh, order for multiplication actually in mathematics. So I'm going to use a uh, five as the beginner, I don't know. I'm just like giving you the options. So it's up to you to like what kind of, you know, like number that you're going to get because it depends on your design. So we're going to have like the uh, different height that we need for probably uh, five is too much. Probably uh, for my design, I need like 2.4 or whatever um, uh, uh, feet or something or meter, uh, whatever you're using, not two meter actually is uh, so. Um, large and big so it's like six feet so and um uh, if i would like to change the distance between these guys so i, I think this is a huge slider 
So I'm going to get back again to two. And OK, so I'm going down and going up. So yeah, I think it's good. So now I have like the fewer slider uh, and I have like the distance between the sliders a little bit, you know, just like bigger. So now I have a better sense in here. All right. So what else that I'm going to do in here? I'm going to add um, a um, um, offset. So offset uh, surface for both sides. There are two of these guys. One of them is offset surface for both sides. The other one is offset surface. So their names are the same. Sometimes you see uh, the same names in Grasshopper, but don't worry. So uh, they're working differently. Sorry, I made a mistake. So I want to offset for both sides, not this one. Yeah, this guy. So and the distance that I'm going to work is the distance for each side that we got in here and then both side and then I can use this and then create a solid geometry. I, can I have the solid geometry? Yes, I do have the option to make a solid geometry. So you, if you're if you're not familiar with the term solid geometry, you can do some research and then see what is the term solid geometry. So I spend like at least one hour in my classes to um, to teach solid geometries. So and then um, uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to have the surface first of all and then the distance. So I need to hook the surface that I got. These are the surfaces coming out of the extrusion. So which means that the output for this component that we got in here, these are the surfaces. So we have the untrimmed surfaces. So how many surfaces that we got? So we got 20. So we got 20 surfaces in here. One, two, three, four, five. And then if you count it, all the way to the last one is going to be 20 uh, surfaces actually in here. Actually 21 because we started from zero and then going to 20, which means that 21 surfaces. So and then um, also the distance in here. So I'm going to have the distance. The distance is it should be very small. I'm going to have like the slider between zero and probably uh, 0.8. So 0.80. So I'm going to have to slider between 0 and 0 0.80. So how you're going to get this slider between the specific number. So you can add the first number, for example, number one, and then you can add like the smaller sign or you can add three points and uh, three dots actually in here. And then the last number or the uh, uh, highest uh, uh, value that you want from that domain that you got. So it, it's going to be between one and zero. You don't need to go all the way to this. Um, window and then do the correspond um, do the adjustment in here but if you need to do the adjustment you can do it later so and then the distance that we got in here the surface that we got in here so now we got something very interesting so now we got the shears probably these are like too uh thick and then i would like to add both sides i don't want to see it like on one side so uh, what is getting in here and then this guy is needing and uh, although that it's um uh, running actually without this, but if you want to have uh, the both sides in here, so you need to feed this with a component that is called Boolean operator. So I'm going to use a Boolean toggle uh, component in here. So that Boolean operator is between and false and true. So false is zero and the true is one, which means that it's, if it's false, nothing is going to happen. But look at this. If I'm going to double click on this and then turn it to true, now you have the double uh, sign actually uh, um, offset in here. So one side, two side, and then create a Boolean. Yes, it's uh, by default is untrue, but I'm going to put another just for the sake of reference. I'm going to put another component in here. Copy paste that. Control C, Control B, and now we have the geometries in here. So and then people say, oh, you know what? This is really cool. So if I'm going to bake this by right click on uh, this icon in here. And then bake this and then bake it wherever you need. So now you have everything ready and then you can go and then see what's happening in uh, your rendering and then what you would like to do with your rendering. And Let me see if it's going to work in here. So this is. Um, 
there you go. So we have the rendering uh, in here and it, everything is in Rhino ready and then you can change the material if you want and then you can do whatever you want to do. But the interesting part also is something else. So it's the interesting part is telling me that if I would like to add another surface to this, let's say my building has like two surfaces and I would like to add another surface to this. And then what does it mean? It means that if I'm going to grab one more surface of my building, so and then this is another surface of my building. Yep, there you go. So and then I'm going to have this guy. I need to flip this. So if you are not familiar with these kind of things that I'm doing in in Rhino, so you need to. Um, uh, um, um, educate yourself somehow. So I have the sec one surface in here, the second surface in here. So I'm going to delete these guys for now because I don't need these guys. So, and I'm going to turn off this. And I'm going to have these guys as two surfaces of my building. I'm putting this into a sort of, let me see if I, Okay, so I'm going to the elevation part and I'm going to have like the, mm, let's do something else. I'm, I'm just like, I know because it's probably, it's gonna be very confusing for you guys. Uh, let me rotate this uh, for a sec. And then let me have also um, uh, this guy. Uh, move it to the end point of this guy. And then I'm going to, yeah, I think it's, we are, we're good. Very good for both of these guys. So let's say this is the rotation for one side of my building. And I'm going to have the um, rotate 3D. So this guy, and then the start of the axis, end of the axis, then I'm going to rotate this. Let's say this is two side of my building and then the rest of the building is back behind it. So it, these are the design, these are the two surfaces. So I'm using the non-uniform, like like not any rectangle or something to show you that it's capable of doing everything. Obviously, if it's capable of doing this, so it's going to be capable of doing like a kind of simple surface like the rectangle or rectangular sort of uh, planar surfaces. So I'm going to use this and I'm going to add the, this, this is the first surface that I got. So let's say this is my second one. I'm going to add this and then I'm going to turn on this by uh, um, uh, control in the space, space bar. And I'm going to hide these two surfaces. So now I have everything set up in um, Grasshopper already. So I'm going to add this by uh, holding shift. So now I have these two in here. So I'm going also to turn on this. And then now this is the interesting part because the UV of these two surfaces are aligned. So, and then also we don't have any sort of issue with that. It's not a UV, but it's more of a kind of um, contour line that we got in here. They are aligned with each other. So we can see that if I'm going to change this to the Y axis, and I'm going to make this negative three and then positive three and then OK this because this is Y axis. This is Y axis. This is X and this is Z. So along green is Y. So the louver is coming out along Y axis. So I'm going to use this and I'm going to add this getting to negative something 
and a good so I think everything is good so I'm going to turn on this guy yes that's really interesting I think it's it's nicely done so and then I'm going to turn on this and I can now start looking into my building and then if I have more than one surface those surfaces are completely synchronized and then they are following the shaders and then if I would like to do more adjustment to the shaders and in, and in direction for the shaders so I can use other part and then I can see the animated sort of version of what I'm doing what I'm having in here so and then let's say if I use this for animation so I'm going to use this for animation I'm gonna give a very short sort of animation to you guys so animate this I'm going to use uh, cam, that's fine. So we're going to rewrite that previous one. That's fine. So now we got this one, and then we got this, and then we are animating, we got the animated version of this. So everything is just like working perfectly. Done in here, and then I can um, also, um uh, as i said i can also uh you can work with the uh skewness of i don't know if we have that kind of work but uh by changing this so this is working because it's along z then this is helping you to have like the skewed version of the uh um uh, shading and lubering system that you got so you can see this this is really cool so to see that everything is changing based on the uh, numbers that we got along x and y and z axis so what i'm going to do in here i'm going to delete this because we don't need this and oh one more thing if you start working on this guy so as you see that we if we're going to change this distance then we can see that every louver uh, also the, the surfaces also are, are being updated uh proportionally and then also we can change the direction of these guys by changing the uh uh direction of the uh x and y for the um uh, uh, direction for the contour line that we got in here so and then uh, depends on what you would like to do so you can get so many different interesting iterations and then you can work on these guys to see which one is working for your building so and then in the advanced in a very advanced part so you're going to learn how to use these shaders to control the uh, amount of light that you're inviting to the building and then you can assess and optimize the spaces that you got inside the building based on the uh, light and the other climatic um, sort of uh, factors that we got. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to delete this and this and this, and then I'm going to have this guy done. I'm having this guy, I think you're all set in here. So we have uh, the input and we have the information for the um, uh, data for every part that we got. So quick question. Uh, question. Sure. The offset both sides. Um, I can't find that component. Is that in a plugin? So yes, you can go on uh, under. Oh no, sorry, it's not. It's pufferfish. No, sorry. Oh, okay. oh, I'm sorry. So you can you can use the one side, but I would like to use the uh, both side. This is on uh, under pufferfish. Sorry, it's not a um, it's not a default sort of uh, component. But that's uh, that's fine. You know, just like it works. One side also works really perfect, actually. It's, and an output is going to be something like this. Doesn't matter. So yeah. So, and I'm going to um, add this um, to your um, grouping and then grouping this 
and also control G for grouping this and then control G for grouping this and then final output is going to be a barrep and I can solid union solid union these guys so and I can put everything into one container as a barrep container and then I'm going to turn off the rest of the definition if I don't want to see although I would like to see the surfaces at the beginning too. So this is the final geometry that I have and I put it under another group. So I'm going to change the color, but the color that I probably like better. I don't know, it's just like, uh, like different type of colors that you would like to use. So I would say that I have one, um, um, group as the input from Rhino is the first one. So this is the uh, um, this is the facade. This is the facade surfaces. So I got in here, and then this is the um, uh, contouring contouring the uh, um, louvers uh, location for the for the louvers. Uh, let's put it shading. And this guy is going to the um, uh, thickening or extruding, extruding. Um, and in shaping the um, shaping the um, uh, uh, shaders. Oh, oh, sorry. This is not shaping the shaders. This is like only extruding. This is shaping and forming it, um, shaping shape, which is that you have like the thickness. This is like the height, and this is the thickness, and uh, this is the final product. This is the uh, final shaders. There you go. So now we have this guy, and I'm going to save this, and I'm going to share with um, Philip later, and then he can. Um, uh, distribute it to you guys, so. Okay. So I think uh, this is one of the examples that I um, um, the 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 script actually I designed it for this studio. So if you have any questions, so we have eight minutes left. So uh, I think we're not going to make um, anything in eight minutes. So. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I'm not sure if I think it's uh, what do you think, Philip? So do you think that we should um, let him uh, try some of these things and then they can come back again next time and then we can expand? Um, yeah, yeah. I, I think this this was uh, this was this was amazing. You 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 went ninja style on this. Uh, I think this this is awesome. So in the combination with the with the uh, with the script here, we could share the video, and um, I'd say everyone should take a stab at this. Um, and and it's like the it's it's such a valuable um, skill set too. Um, so no, I, I I'd say I, I think we're at a at a good breaking point uh, with um, you know taking it taking a break. Um, 
but also wanted to thank you so much for for uh, spending the last two hours with us um, and introducing us to a new um, for some. Uh, I think this wasn't new, but for some, uh, if this was new, I think this is also an, a, a tremendously valuable uh, skill set. So, um, very cool. Thank the you very much for having me. I'm so excited to see the output for this. And it's just like, I, I'm sorry if I, if it was too fast. I thought, you know, just like, probably you're going to uh, watch these videos, guys, you know, just like later, and then uh, you're going to learn a lot more uh later but i tried to save some time for your studios like oh. every like every other breathe actually i breathe yes yeah. like, <laughs> so yeah. like, no, great like because <laughs> we can we can also uh have a disclaimer with the video just watch it at half speed you know so <laughs> so yeah just like let me know if you have any sort of question and then uh phil uh, please feel free to uh uh, if you want to uh, share my information, my contact information and everything with the students, if they have any sort of questions. So uh, Absolutely. hopefully, and, hopefully and next time, yeah, hopefully next time we're going to have like some Q&A at the beginning. And then after that, we can start with the uh, next part, right? Yeah. And we for now, we have uh, June 1st and 5th reserved for us to revisit us. OK, so yeah, unless uh, unless something changes, um, we're going to hold that, but uh, you and I could probably uh, um, confirm that. Sure. June uh, 1st and then 5th. And then uh, if we change something like uh, probably 24 hours before that, if you let me know that, yeah. that would be awesome. Yeah. OK. All right. Cool. Hey, thanks so much, Eric. My pleasure. Thanks, Eric. Yeah. Thanks, Eric. Sweet. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. All right. Take a break. You got something Thank at you. six. <laughs> Take care, Phil. All right. Take yeah. care, Don. Good to see you. Bye-bye. Good right. to see you too, Eric. All right. Is everyone still there? Um, cool. Looks like it, right? Should, should I stop the recording now, Philip? Or uh... um, yeah, yeah. Okay. I think that this would be a good point. Yeah. So um, yeah, so we're we're two hours into our our, our studio.